reaction when you began to hear these stories of right. abuse? What was your, how were you feeling at the time? Were you kind of amazed, astonished, were you unbelieving? How would you say uh, you reacted when you began to hear this testimony? Yeah, you know, uh, being a lawyer, I, I'm not sure I was that emotional about it as I was so interested in making sure we got everything out. Um, because what I was hearing was not surprising because we had been, uh, you know, advised of pretty much what was going to be said. So my role as chairman was to make sure that we didn't leave anything unsaid, that we didn't forget something. And so my recollection is, was that I was always wanting to make sure we were probing and nothing be left you know, unsaid that needed to be said. So I was probably less emotionally involved at the time because I was more concerned about getting the facts that was going to support the, the conclusions of the report. What, what about what is your reaction to the to, there were also people who were saying that none of this abuse occurred and uh, right, this yeah. is all made up and false. What was your what kind of did you have a reaction at all to the yeah, denials? I, I didn't believe them. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it was tough to say that what they were saying was true. That's not to say that's not to say that that they didn't believe that it wasn't happening. Um, I think there were some who testified who. Uh, didn't believe what was being said was happening, and so we're of the uh, or the opinion that this didn't happen. But uh, and, and so in their mind, they didn't think they were lying. But I mean, I did. I didn't believe them. Uh, I thought they either were very naive, two not involved at all in what's going on, or three just were outright lying, and possibly also this. They thought this was the way it ought to be. What's, what's the problem? What's the big deal? What's the big deal? Where are these kids going to go? What do you, what have, I mean, what have we got, a president of the United States sitting here in this classroom with a brown face? You know, that's going to happen. So what's the big deal? Why spend your time on these kids? Uh, I think that was kind of the mindset. And once you accept that, you know, why spend our time on these kids? Then it doesn't matter what you do to them. You know? If you punish them, you punish them. Was there anything that happened that was that really surprised you during the testimony or well, the taping, reaction? The, the taping of the mouths I thought was unbelievable. I mean, I, that in my mind, I couldn't even imagine that happening and people, uh, you know, and, and we got enough testimony about that to know that that happened. Uh, and even the administration said, well, it, I mean, it was kind of like, well, maybe something like, I mean, they, they just kind of passed over it. Uh, but it was, uh, it, it was, yeah, there was no freedom for the children, basically. And it, was, it, was, it was an intimidation uh, constantly. Uh, that was what we, that's what we sensed, that's what we concluded. And uh, in that kind of an environment, the child's not going to be able to, to get educated. I want to go back to... Do you remember how the California State Advisory Panel was contacted? Where did they, where did the initial dialogue between between the panel and the community start? Do you remember how that occurred? Well, uh, I don't specifically. Uh, what generally would happen? What generally happens is that either a member of the State Advisory Committee comes across an issue which he or she thinks ought to be addressed, and then brings it to the committee and say, "Look, I've got a complaint from." Her. In this area, and then it brought to the committee, and and they uh, then work and talk to the the staff about maybe going out and investigating this, or the staff itself may get a complaint uh, about a particular incident, and then the staff will send out one of its staff persons to inquire around and uh, interview, and if they begin to believe that there's a, a real civil rights issue here, then bring it to the attention of the director, uh, who would be Phil Montes, and say, look, I think, you know, this is a big enough issue here. Also recognize this, you cannot address every civil rights violation 
and investigate it. I mean, that's not the role of the State Advisory Committee. The role of the State Advisory Committee was to get those issues that impact a lot of people and to bring it to the attention of the State of California so that there can be brought change. And to bring change, you need to, it has to be far reaching enough that people can identify with it and say, yeah, that's something we need to change. You know, if uh, you've got to establish patterns, not just single incidents. Is there a pattern here? Is there a custom here that needs to be changed versus, you know, one teacher who doesn't like Mexicans and beats up on them? I mean, you know, no, is there a pattern that this goes on and is allowed? That's what the State Advisory Committee looks at you know, and wants to get. That's what the staff looks at. And if something comes to them and they begin to see a pattern and they think that this is something that needs to be exposed, then they bring it to the advisory committee and they say, look, we have this issue here. And the advisory committee would look at it and say, yeah, that's an issue. Let's go, let's look at that. And we would go into, uh, then, then they would set up for the hearing. They, the staff would line up the, the witnesses, uh, the people would, and they would know this from the interviews and so forth and identify for us, okay, here's Joe Lopez, he's going to testify about this, etc. I down the line, and so that we begin to get it on the record. So that when the report is issued, we have something that we can point to in the testimony that supports our conclusion. Are there any other examples, of course, of corporal punishment that you, that the panel heard? I heard, you know, taping and... Uh, yeah, I recall the taping, and I recall the shaking, you know, shaking the child. Um, I do recall, I think one student said he lost a tooth. Uh, I mean, it was, you know, it was, uh, it was something that you just thought, how can that go on, it's, how, how can that go on the classroom? And it, we heard enough of it to, to recognize that this was, this was a pattern, and there did not to be, there did not seem to be any reprisal um, when when teachers did this. So you mentioned earlier that there were reprisals against people who spoke, people who contacted the committee. What kind of reprisals well, were you a, made aware of? There, a fear of loss of uh, loss of employment. Um, I mean, people, you know, were people that were working for other people for companies and. Um, they, there was a, you know, a concern and fear that they would lose their job if they, if they caused any kind of uh, criticism, or supported uh, those that were criticizing, uh, then there would be that kind of reprisal. Now, we made it very clear, and I think we may have even said this at the hearing that that any reprisal against anyone for coming forth and testifying uh, would be investigated by the Department of Justice um, because persons have a right to, to speak. And I'm hoping that that would be enough to, to prevent any serious reprisal. But um, my recollection is that there was, there was an incident, uh, not as a result of our hearing, but they pointed to, and I, I I'm sorry, I can't recall now, but they pointed to an incident where a person lost his job because he had um, he had raised a criticism about the administration or the school board, and that person uh, was no longer working at the position he was. Now that came, that was before we had come on the you know we had come on the scene, so that wasn't attributed to our hearing, but that's what was told to us at the time. One of the things that we are looking at is, uh, do, you, do you think that, that um, led to poor performance in high school and and uh, and uh, lack of lack of entrance into college? Do you think that these conditions can lead to that? I mean, you probably don't have any data, any evidence because you didn't stick around that long. But uh, what, what yeah, do you well, think? Our, the, the thrust of our report was that if if these conditions are going on. And if the and, and clearly the records, uh, the scholastic records of these students was that they were not being competitive with their peers, 
there is very little chance that they're going to be able to go on anywhere uh, in the academic world because they their, their scores were not such that they would be competitive to be admitted into anything in the future. And once again, it was a self-fulfilled prophecy in terms of where these kids were going to go. They were going to wind up in the fields and the low-paying jobs, which is what was expected of them. And it was just a self-fulfilled prophecy because you're not, you don't expect anything more from them. Why spend your time trying to educate them? So your main job was to get them to behave and make sure, and behave meant don't cause any waves, don't cause any problems, uh, just get through here and don't bother to learn because you're not going anywhere. You think this is pervasive? I think it was pervasive in that in that school district, um, and uh, you know today in, in today's uh, world, uh, it may be it may still may be there, but it's a lot more subtle than you know it, it was in, in Guadalupe. You think uh, we we my my book talks about the two hundred and thirty Vietnam era veterans that served in Vietnam or were in service between sixty five. In 1975, 230, which is three times above the national average. Do you think the conditions in the school had anything to do with that? That it, the it, fact that they're it, going. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it could have been. I mean, um, if you come out of school and um, you're limited in, in your you're limited in your uh, education, uh, what? Where would you, what would be a place to go where you could become somebody? I share with you, I grew up in a predominantly African American community. And uh, during the Korean War. And the, uh, at that time we had, there was the, uh, the draft. And so each draft board had to meet a certain quota. Well, I was going to law. I was going to law. Or I was a college, at UCLA, and I got. I had exemptions, so I went back because one of the exemptions was if you went to school. Well, I graduated. I went to. I went to school undergraduate and did the four years and three and a half years, and I wasn't going to be able to go to law school till September, and I graduated in March. So I had from March to September, where I was uh, exposed to being drafted and I wanted to go to law school. So I went to my draft board to tell them, because I couldn't get an exemption because I wasn't in school then. So I went to my draft board and I said, I plan on going to law school. And my question is, but I've got this period of time where I won't have an exemption. And my question is, will I be drafted during this period of time? The draft board told me, no, don't worry about it because we meet our quotas every month by the volunteers. And that's because that was a black, an African-American community where a lot of kids were dropouts. And the fact that I was going on to college, uh, I, was in a, I was coming from a neighborhood that what was there for these African-American kids to do but to join the services because they, they, weren't, getting the, they weren't getting the education in the schools as well as other parts of the city. And I think a similar type of thing could very well have occurred here in Guadalupe. Mm -hmm. how, is, how, how are educational rights civil rights? Because these people are in an educational setting, but your committee embraced it as a civil rights question. Right? In what way is uh, well, a civil rights question? Well, it became question? a civil rights question uh, because it was, I think, based on race. Based on race. Uh, if, if, if all the kids, if all the kids were uh, getting this type of education, uh, it may not have been a civil rights. But if you're providing education, uh, you cannot discriminate um, against someone because they are uh, a particular ethnic race, and that's what was happening here, Mexican kids. Uh, you've got a, if you've got an all Chinese. Uh, class, it's not going to be enough to just teach them in English. You're going to have to address them so that they get a fair chance of education. So that's what, that's what we had here is that 
in, in, in Guadalupe was that uh, the Mexican-American kids were not getting a, a equal access to education. I was going to ask, was, was the school board or the community critical of themselves in any manner, or are they just in complete utter denial that this was going on? No, it was anybody. Well, the board... There was a guy named Ra Sarate, what was his name, Joaquin Sarate. Do you remember him? He was a city I remember the name. I, I remember the name. I don't recall, you know, the, the specifics. Uh, the school board as a, as a group, as a body, was uh, defensive in terms of what, what they were doing. I mean, they were, uh, they were critical of our committee. Um, there was uh, one of the, one of the uh, issues that was being pushed by the activists of the Mexican community was to have, was the hiring of bilingual teachers and, uh, and Mexican American teachers, uh, arguing that uh, I think that the, the Mexican American teachers would then and could become then role models for the students that they too can become educated as evidenced by the the, the Mexican American teacher and being bilingual the students would then be able to talk to someone who can perhaps explain something to them that they didn't quite grasp in English uh, the school board although not my, my recollection, the school board not saying we, we don't hire Mexican-Americans, uh, saw no need for the hiring of bilingual teachers and said, you know, we're, we're, going to get, we're going to get there. Well, one of those persons that said there was no need to hire a bilingual teacher, uh, my recollection was that there was a Mexican-American who was on the board, and that was his position, that the... Uh, you know, hiring a bilingual teacher, a Mexican American teacher, was not uh, necessarily a, a necessity for the school district. Uh, so it, it, that the status quo, and that's very common. I mean, in Los Angeles, which is a much bigger district, much bigger uh, issues, but the, the the issue was always the same. You know, Mexican American teachers were not being hired, and if they were being hired, they weren't being, their bilingualism wasn't being utilized, and if it was being utilized, then they got into trouble. You know, and that's why you had the, the walkouts in 1968. Uh, children weren't allowed, the kids weren't allowed to speak Spanish on, in the classrooms or on, on campus. So, it, it's, uh, that kind of environment, that kind of atmosphere doesn't lend to education. And I think, you know, historically that's been. Um, one of my clients is the California Association for Bilingual Education. Uh, the issue of bilingual education has been at the forefront politically. And Americans have done this unique thing. They have tied language to patriotism. If you don't speak English, then you're not a patriot. Unless we want to draft you to go fight a war, then you're a patriot. But what other countries deal with language, which is a skill, as a basis to determine whether a person ought to be educated or not, or ought to be, quote, an American? Um, we're the only country that gets hung up on languages. Uh, other countries, uh, their citizens have no several languages, but we have this English only concept that's been adopted and accepted by many leaders that if you don't speak English somehow you're not equivalent to everybody else. You're not as good as anybody else. The same people that advocate that have their children going to colleges learning several languages because they know that that's where the economic route is. We have been a nation that has this tremendous resource of languages because people come from all over the world to live here, from Asia, Europe, South America, Central America, and they bring with them this rich, these rich languages. So we are like a nation that has a forest and we go out and we cut off, we cut all the trees and burn them. We have these children coming with us with all these languages and we tell them you can't speak those languages here. You must learn English. 
So it's like a nation, we have a forest, we cut and burn down all the forest, and then we go out and buy lumber from other people. Mm -hmm. Here, we kill all the languages so that when they get through, when John Gomez gets through school and the university, we say, well, Gomez, good, you speak Spanish? He says, no, I don't speak Spanish, man, I don't speak Spanish. What, you don't speak Spanish? No, see, we killed it. So now what we have to do is we have to go out and get someone from another country to come in and speak Spanish because we killed the tree at the early stages so that never grew up. And that's what we've done with our languages. That's what we do, and we do it subtly now, but here in Guadalupe it was very, very um, outward in terms of our very dim. You, you, you think you never, if you were still on the panel, you ever encounter a condition like this, say now, or is it something that has I would hope not. Uh, <laughs> I would hope we'd never find that here now. Um, but you know, uh, when uh, Prop 227 was on the on the ballot uh, years ago, uh, English only, uh, it got it got to that kind of a, a an issue where parents were having to come forward to the schools and uh, you know insisting on on having their children being educated and uh, to get them being placed in bilingual classes. Okay. Can you think of anything else, Harris? It, it seems to me that uh, our political system is 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 it's not working. It's broken. That that is a polarization, you know, between the so-called Republicans and Democrats, and that has created an ambience and an environment where really it, it puts into question our diversity. You know, it, it, it kind of, uh, you know, when you peel the onion, you can see that there's racism there. There is this fear that these immigrants, that us, are diluting the fabric of this society. Right. And that is compounded with this idea that the United States is losing its standing in the world. I wonder what, what are your thoughts in terms of going forward? And if you could uh, answer to him. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Um, I think we have to look at some, some history of our country and some history of others. Um, Spain came to the New World in 1541, Cortes. And by 1840, the Mestizo was the majority population. So today, when you speak of or think of a Mexican, you don't think of a Spaniard and you don't think of an Indian, you think of this image of a Mexican. The United States, the English didn't come to uh, Plymouth Rock till a hundred years later, 16, 1640 or whatever year it was. And they came and they encountered the Native Americans. The Spaniards married Indians. The English came and they killed them. Then we had the Spaniards coming up from the west, or from the south and into the southwest, and they encountered Native Americans and there was, there was marriages occurring there. Then you had the African American being brought over as slaves, and then you had the Asians coming. So in terms of the early, in the early stages of this country, an American's image was never the Native American. The image was that of a European. So we say American, we have this image of a European. And that continued. What you have now is you have intermarriages between Asians, African Americans, South Americans, Mexicans, Europeans, and the image of the American is starting to become different. It's no longer the image of the European. Now, if you're of European, that can be a little threatening. But if you recognize what is going on, all we are doing is becoming 
and trying to come up with a visual image of what an American is. Tied with that has been the language issue. To be an American, you had to speak English. But what we've done is we've absorbed in the English language a lot of languages in our speech today. From Japanese, Chinese, to Spanish, I mean, all of those words, different words have become part of the English language. So what I see is a, an evolving nation that is searching for its identity in terms, with the concept that somehow everybody has to be uniform. There's too many, there's too many people that have come here for the same reasons, liberty to have that happen overnight. It will take centuries, but it will happen because the intermarriages are occurring, the children are coming, the new generation are, are really colored blind in terms of who they, their friends are, who they date, etc. Uh, so I have high hopes from that standpoint. If we can maintain our diversity, uh, acceptance of diversity, then we'll continue to be we'll continue to be a, a leader in the in, in the world because we have roots to the entire part of the world. Uh, I think we saw that with Obama goes you know goes to Africa and immediately they can identify him with him, uh, and, and so I see that more of that happening.